So I did a lot of preparations in these seven weeks. Uh, thankfully, because of my experience, I was able to sort out the, the PR and the press and the sponsors quite quickly. And so I focused on sailing, spending as much time getting to know the boat as possible. I chartered the boat. So, you know, I'd never really sailed a Figaro much before this. So I wanted to understand everything about the boat so that when I was in the race, everything came very easily for me. So you can see here, I did, I don't know how many spinnaker hoists and drops <laughs> every day with other people on the boat just watching. <laughs> it's like, aren't you going to help me? Nope, you have to do it yourself, Hannah. I practiced climbing the mast many times because I knew that was an a, a reality that I might face. And when you're out at sea and the boat is bouncing all over the place, you don't want to be working out which rope and which bit of equipment you should be using. Everything like this should be second nature to you by the time you start a race. Down below as well, I spent a lot of time on the navigation and the weather training and everything like that. I used um, Maxi, um, but a lot of other competitors use different things. Uh, and I practiced a lot of weather routing. The Ostar, because there have been so many editions of this race, there's a lot of history. There's a lot you can find out about the typical weather patterns that come across the Atlantic. So we spent a lot of time studying those and, and as you will know it, dry sailing, basically, working out possible routes that you could take, looking at the history of the race and working out what might happen, different scenarios, studying the charts so I recognized the names of places when I got close to them so that nothing was a surprise during the race. And this was good, you know, when you're tired and you haven't had any sleep and you haven't had any, uh, anything to eat and you're cold and you're wet, the last thing you want to be doing is trying to remember which button you have to press to get your weather routing to work out a route for you. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And then those seven weeks passed very quickly, too quickly, really. I could have done with another seven years, actually, rather than seven weeks. But we got to the start line in Plymouth, and um, I had some great help from, from two friends of mine, Chris and Simon, who helped prepare the boat for me and helped me with my training. And that was invaluable. I just didn't have the time to do everything myself. So having people that I trusted to work with me and sail with me during my training was fantastic. So this is the start day. I'm looking, I'm smiling, but really I was scared, stiffless. And then we started. Three and a half thousand miles all the way to America. I've flown to America many times. It takes about seven hours from England. I thoroughly recommend that as a mode of travel as opposed to sailing there. It's a lot easier. In fact, it was a day before I was due to finish and my parents flew out to the, to the finish line and my mum phoned me from the airport and said, see you tomorrow. Seven hours later, she phoned me and said, we're there. I thought, well, that's easy, isn't it? Why have I bothered to sail all this way? <laughs> Here's a quick video well, about life on board. It's quite windy out here. It probably doesn't look that bad, but it is. I don't know if you can see all the instruments there. We're up to about something 25 knots. And because it's been quite rough over the last few days, there's a bit of a sea running, but nothing too bad. But the sun's come out, so I thought I'd take this opportunity show you what quite is like being out at sea on your own in the middle of the chopping Atlantic. If you think about it like that, it's quite scary. So there you are, quite scary. <laughs> um, I found that suddenly you were out there and one day I just went, oh my God, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, miles from land. Because I hadn't had the time and uh, to really prepare as well as I could have done, I, I focused on the physical aspects of it rather than actually the mental preparation that some people go through to get ready for a race like this. I had done a lot of solo sailing before, so being alone didn't worry me, the actual realization. But when, you're in, when, when you see this big chart and there's just a little dot in the middle of it and you know that at one end is America and one end is Europe, it suddenly freaks you out a little bit. And I did get a little bit nervous from time to time. But 
if you zoom in, <laughs> it makes it a lot easier <laughs> because then you can't see America and you can't see Europe. And I spent a lot of time on the navigation and the weather routing and things like this. I would plot, obviously it would automatically plot my course, but I would plot other boats' positions, their speeds. I was very competitive during the race and I wanted to know that I was going to do the best that I possibly could. I'm not the best weather router in the world. I'm actually not the best sailor in the world, but I wanted to make the most of the skills that I did have and my ambition and my determination and my drive so that I could get there as quickly as I could. I also didn't enjoy lots of it. You know, some of it was amazing and looking back at the experience, it was fantastic. But when you're not having a particularly nice time, you want it to finish as quickly as possible. So that was one of the other reasons that I pushed so hard to get there. So these are the other boats that were taking part and, and how far ahead and behind they were in front of me. And I did this a few times a day. So uh, all the weather routing and study that I did before the Ostar was absolutely useless. Because normally, you have an Azores high. <laughs> we had an Azores low. <laughs> and so everything that we had looked at, all, all the history of the race, all the weather and everything like that, was useless. And we really had to think on our feet. You can't have any weather routing during the race, so everything has to be done on board. So this meant that we had a very fast, but very windy Ostar. The, the race was predominantly off the wind instead of being an upwind slog all the way. We had a lot of reaching, um, not necessarily a lot of downwind, but certainly a lot of reaching conditions. And that meant that, uh, that we were very fast. It also meant that uh, uh, a lot of people became subject to damage. And there were a lot of retirements in the race, unfortunately, especially earlier on. We had one very nasty storm within about an hour, uh, yeah, it started about an hour after the start, actually. But within a day, within 24 hours, it was really horrible. And I think five people dropped out within the first 24 hours. That's also why we lost both the multi-hulls. They just, you know, some boats either can or can't deal with that. And unfortunately, those two entries uh, withdrew. We also had one man who turned back. He was actually winning because his wife phoned him up and said, if you don't come home now, I'll divorce you. So he turned around and went home. <laughs> he was actually winning, so I'm not, I think it would have been worth pushing on, but uh, <laughs> he didn't think so. Um, so yes, yeah, so our weather was very different. We had a lot of heavy weather, uh, a, a lot of reaching conditions. And about halfway into the race, um, Myself and another Dutch competitor, uh, he was in a 40, uh, an, an open 40 and I was in the Figaro, which is under 35 foot. We both suddenly realized at the same time that we both had a shot at the records for the race. So suddenly you're not just in a race trying to beat other people, but he was competing for the, for the 40 foot record and I was competing for the under 35 foot record. So suddenly there was a whole nother element to this race that I had never anticipated. You know, I thought I was just going to sail from A to B and if I did okay, then that would be good. And, you know, I never thought that possibly I could get a world record. But it wasn't always easy, as I said. That's a really attractive picture, huh? Well, it's, uh, it's Monday evening, um, about 6 o'clock, and uh, you'll be glad to know the winds have calmed down. We now only have 38 knots, as opposed to 45, 48 knots, which is what we had earlier. Um, I've just been out on deck to uh, try and sort a few things out, uh, tie up my mainsail again, where I've reefed it, which has come undone, and uh, just have a quick check over everything while it's still daylight just to make sure there are no massive dramas out there um, it's okay so now we just have to sit tight and wait for it to drop some more um, just look for the forecast the latest forecast and uh, in 12 hours time we should be down to about 25 knots which would be amazing um, not really enjoying this actually truth be known, there have been some amazing parts of this trip, but this bit's been really horrid. They're really hard. I just carry on moaning like that for a while. <laughs>